Yeah, Warren Murphy, I think most of you know me, so maybe a couple on here. Well, one I know doesn't, but uh, I've been involved with this organization for, um, I think, 47 years since we were the Wyoming uh, Association, uh, Wyoming Church Coalition. And um, we've done many, many things. We're a small group um, with, made up of many denominations and now some other uh, faiths as well. And um, um, over that period of time, we've done, like I said, we've done so many things, changed some things in Wyoming, and led some movements in Wyoming. And our concern today is the Wyoming Interfaith Network is uh, a lot of things. Uh, we're doing this training for leadership people. Uh, people want to be leaders from different faith traditions. We're in our first session, and this past weekend we did travel the reservation, got a lot of talk to a lot of people who've been involved historically and otherwise. And um, one of the issues, of course, there is water and how it affects the Wind River Reservation. We even saw the diversion point at the um, dam where that all happens. So the leadership group did that. But we want to do this book discussion group to really uh, learn specifically in, in a poetic way about what happens and what happened on the reservation 20 some years ago in the book and now um, how that affects today's reservation and that issue is still there. Um, what you see in Clearwater is the book that we're talking about tonight. This is uh, one of his, Jeff, it's one of your first copies, I think. And uh, it goes back to the beginning. And then he also has another one that I loved, which is called A Long Road Home. And that's a, a fascinating book as well. And it tells you, gives you a feel of the history and the culture of the state. And I'm sure Jeff will talk about his other adventures, which include some documentaries. The most recent one is um, uh, Home from School, I believe, is the, is the way that's, that happened. It's getting a lot of coverage nationally and otherwise. And uh, I've known Jeff for, I think, 30 some years. <laughs> We've spent time hiking together, uh, being on Leadership Wyoming together, um, doing weird things together, which I won't mention. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and he also is the face for many years of Wyoming Public TV, all the political debates and other ones. So with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Jeff. He can do some more introductions of himself. And um, uh, we'll just see where all this goes. I think it'll be quite exciting and also uh, uh, education. Go for it, Jeff. Thanks, Warren. I was, I was kind of hopeful Warren would keep the introduction really short because there is a Phillies game on right now. But... He, he still rattled out a little bit, which is kind of his way. Um, we don't, you know, as I understand from Anne-Marie and others, we don't have a lot of structure to this, and I like that. Um, I do hope that everybody who's listening in and wants to participate will feel free to just unmute and interrupt when the spirit moves. Um, I do tend to sometimes talk to fill space, and I don't want to do that if I can help it. So I'll... I'll let, let me talk a little bit about the book. And again, I, I know that probably a good percentage of you haven't read it yet. Um, that's sort of to my advantage because it means I can talk about what's in it um, and not just be boring you with stuff you already know. But I won't do too much of that um, because I think I'd like to be led by questions, finding out what it is that you're curious about or any kind of you know, background information that you want. And you know, I have to say the book's over 20 years old and the writing of it more than that. Um, so when I look at it now, I, I actually don't remember writing certain paragraphs and sentences. And uh, I'm embarrassed when I see how I reordered some chronology to make it work dramatically a little better. There are some people on the reservation, I'm sure, who you know may even show up tonight who would uh, give it a chance to tell me or tell you the things I got wrong. But um, yeah, strange enough, it's still in print. It never has sold much. Um, it won a few prizes and got some attention, uh, but it, it, again, it didn't sell much, so I never got asked to do a sequel, and that means, to a degree, I'm a little out of date on a lot of things, although I have um, maintained a lot of relationships on the reservation, um, but I'll just start with what, what my agent and publisher were expecting and, and looking for when we, when we signed the contract to do this book. They wanted a portrait of an Indian reservation. And this is, you know, this is New York. They're, they're kind of like, oh, there's that world out there and, and 
we don't have a book that's just a portrait of a reservation. Um, I, I thought, number one, I need more, a little more structure than that. I needed something to hang the story on rather than just some sort of sprawling attempt to understand Wind River. And of course, we begin that whole adventure with the presumption of it, which is, you know, a white journalist who grew up in California is now going to tell you the inside story of what life is like uh, for the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho. That's, there's a lot of presumption in that. Um, and in fact, I think today it'd be very unlikely that a book like this by a person like me would get published. Um, if it were Debbie Thunder or Jordan Dresser, you know, some, there's some very capable writers at Wind River uh, that would get published. Um, but I was a greedy journalist then and I'm a greedy writer now as well. And when there's a really good story, um, I'm gonna go for it. And this one, again, when I needed to find a little structure for it, I decided water was a great structure because it gives you a, a sort of topographical map. You can follow the water, say upstream and out at the divide at the very end of the story. Um, it gives you, a, in this case, a very dramatic story that was unfolding while I was working for the Casper Star and actually specifically asked to have that be my beat to cover the reservation. Um, and, and right as I did that, the whole drama of an assertion of water rights, treaty-based water rights by the, by the tribes took place. And, and I was lucky enough to be able to cover it and get to know all the principles involved, uh, both native and non-native. Um, there was a period, my, so my wife is an attorney, Virginia, and she began working for the, for the Northern Arapaho tribe. And at, at a certain point, got involved in some of the issues that I was covering having to do with water. So I put the book on hold for, I, I think, a couple of years, because it didn't seem like I should be writing about it while she had a, an interest in it. And then in what is fairly typical of non-Indian law firms and tribes, uh, they got thrown out for a little while. And while they were thrown out, I finished the book. Um, <clears throat> that's just kind of uh, inside baseball. But the you know, this is a nonfiction book. The key to writing nonfiction, I think, uh, is always trust. You're going to tell real stories about real people. Um, in this case, you are a person from a different culture who's going to write a story about Native people and uh, tribes with, with very distinct histories and traditions. Um, they've known a lot of people. They're not, it's not like anybody's naive about this when a journalist pops in. They've got parachute journalists coming in all the time. They've got anthropologists coming in all the time. They've got missionaries coming in all the time. They totally know the game with people who in many ways are there to do good, but are also serving some self-interest. So I knew that, and I never pretended going into this to be anything but what I was, a journalist in pursuit of what I thought was a good story. Um, not somebody who was looking for friends, not somebody who was too eager to get into the sweat lodge. Um, but I always worried and always would worry um, and certainly did after the book was finished about how it was received and how it was perceived on the reservation. Um, you know, a lot of the readings and things that I did were off reservation. That's in many ways where a lot of the interest in the book is. I'm happy to say that today it's, it's used um, in, in tribal courses and education. Um, but I always worried, how, how did people feel about it? How did people on the reservation feel about it? Um, and, you know, outside of those who became really close friends, people like Dick Baldus, uh, I didn't really have any way to know that, really. Um, so, I, I mean, I could tell you some stories about some of the reactions I did get early on, particularly from, from tribal people. Um, you, you may, when you read it, if you haven't already, you'll see that in, a, in an instance or two, well, one in particular, uh, I had to give a character, a person, a name. Um, I couldn't use their real name. This came up very late in the writing of the book. Um, somebody who just felt I was going to, it was going to be just too painful for their family if I put it all in. That was really hard for me. I just don't like it when, when I encounter nonfiction books where there is a composite character or made up character, whatever it might be with a name that isn't, I couldn't call them up the next day, but uh, I had to do that. And I remember when the, the book was finished, um, there was a scene that I think I, I might even read a little, if I do some reading here uh, about planting fish where the tribes 
basically did an end run first using the Fish and Wildlife Service where Dick Baldus worked to plant fish in the river. And then later just doing it on their own with some help from uh, some environmental groups. This being an issue because while they won a huge water right in the lawsuit that this is featured in the book, um, the state was able to put real limits on what they could do with that water right. And so when the tribe wanted to stop the dewatering of the Wind River by putting in stream flow in there, protecting it, so that it couldn't be taken out by irrigators, which is what had happened, um, so the fish could survive in the river year round, um, they got into real battle with the courts, with the feds, really, because the Wyoming delegation did not want a water right to be used outside of Wyoming water law, which has certain beneficial uses that do not include unless the state says it can include um, in-stream flow for fisheries benefit. Why did I tell you all that? Well, because I described a scene in which fish were planted and I included this person in that scene. And I realized later, he he may if he had been there, he wasn't there in a way that I could actually have reported on it. And I remember him coming to me and saying, well, I guess that's what you do when you write a book like this. Hmm. And I thought, ah. Oh. You know, because I really did that to protect your identity guy. But that's the kind of thing that happens. And, and I bring that up because I'm going to tell you at the very end of this little opening talk, when I finally think I got an answer to that question of how do people feel about me, someone like me writing a book like this in this particular book. Um, I guess, I guess, uh, I could go to that because I don't want to go on and on about this. I want to hear what what you would like me to talk about from within the book. But I'll just say, uh, as I say, there's been no call for a sequel. Um, so I have not continued to write the story of Wind River and Water. But uh, I make television documentaries now after working for PBS for a while. And in a way, it does mean that I've continued to kind of tell that story. Um, most recently with a documentary about um, Indian boarding schools and about a really meaningful and, and important quest to bring back the remains of three and now four Northern Arapaho children who were buried in Pennsylvania at the Car Carlisle Indian Industrial School, which was one of these boarding schools where they took children back in the late um, 19th century and got them as far away from the reservation as they could, took all their traditional clothing off, cut their hair, and tried to turn them into little people like our kids. Um, Anyway, working on that documentary uh, is an indication of what I think I can say is true, which is it isn't the only thing I do, but I have come back again and again to some of the wonderful stories and people on the Wind River Reservation. And, and I think I'll wrap this up so we can get on to other things by just saying that, you know, time goes by. Um, we all move on to other things. There's a whole new generation of leadership on the reservation, which has been fascinating to watch. And... I'm still asking myself that question I asked, you know, 20 plus years ago when the book came out, which is how do tribal people really feel about this, especially when an outsider comes in and writes this story? Uh, have I done right? Have I done right by them? Um, should I feel good about this? Or should I really have turned it over, which I should have in some ways, to a younger person like Jordan Dresser, a tribal member? But I didn't. And as, as we're living part-time on the East Coast now, and uh, my wife and I were leaving for Maryland not long ago, a few weeks ago, um, I had taken a, I guess you'd call it a trophy that we'd won for, from the, um, it's, I think it's called the Cowboy Hall of Fame down in Oklahoma City for Best Documentary. And it was a big statue of a, uh, a rider on horseback. And we thought, who will I give this to? I wanted to give it to somebody who participated in the film. Um, and I thought of you from the Soldier Wolf, who was, primary person in it but she said no no take it to you friday because he's he's a rancher he's a cowboy and you've been in bad health i hadn't been out to see him in a while and i called his daughter fauna and she said you know he'd love it so i did and then we were i got i gave him the statue it was really kind of touching just to see him and talk to him um came back home we finished packing we're getting ready to leave we literally are getting out the door and fauna calls and says hugh really wants you to come back you need to come back. So we came back and um, go in there. And I, I actually have trouble telling this story. I mean, you know, he's, he's got some uh, balance problems and stuff. He can't get around much now. You really have to go see him. 
we got in and I brought a, a painting to give to Fauna because I, I, I knew this was going to be something about gift giving. And you was there and he first thanked me uh, this endless kindness and thanking that I have experienced among people like, like Hubert. And then um, for the documentary and what it had meant to him, he was one of the only surviving elders of the four that we featured in the documentary. But then he turned to Berthinia, who was with me, and thanked her for the legal work over the years that she'd done for the tribe. And it was just the sweetest thing, because that, as many things happen, it was a relationship between her law firm and the, and the tribe that had, had been in, had deteriorated in various ways. It was just so thoughtful and so kind. And I just happened to have it here. We, we came home with this beautiful blanket from here. Um, my experience, these are people who don't forget. And these are people with really good hearts. And uh, I don't want to generalize like that. I'm just giving you a very specific story here. But I can tell you that it reverberated for me all the way back to writing the book about Wind River, what you, what you see in clear water. Because uh, as much as I think I'm a cold hearted journalist and try to be one when I have to be, um, it really matters to me that, uh, that this matters to people like Hugh Friday. And again, there, there's now a hundred things I could talk about. I could do a reading from the book if anybody would like it, but I think maybe I'll pause for a moment at least and see if anybody wants to comment or ask questions or continue this conversation in some other way. I'd love to hear a reading from the book. Your writing is so beautiful. And as a fellow author, uh, I just marveled at things and that's my I don't know if that's breaking up at my end or at, you, at Rebecca's end. Anyway, I did, I did hear you say maybe we could do a reading. And yeah, I, would, I would love to do a reading. I'd be happy to do that. I, I, I still want to give a moment here for anybody who might have a question they want to ask. It can be about the book or about the making of the book mm -hmm. or about whatever I might know about uh, things on the reservation now or, or in the community around the reservation. I'm trying to unmute. Mm -hmm. This is Sally. You're unmuted. Okay, great. Hey, Jeffrey, um, your book is profound. And I'm kind of a poet, um, theologian, and can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's so much in there. And um, I don't want to preoccupy with questions, but it, on November 19th, there will be a panel to discuss your book. And one of the members of that panel is a natural resources advisor for Alvin County, who's very, very much about how do we honor these resources. So I would invite you to that on November 15th. But um, also when I was reading your book, there were things that you just said graciously. And what we're not talking about up front is you captured the beauty, the integrity, the profundity of Wyoming. Thank you. Do you want to speak to that? It's like, no, God is here. Well, I, I don't, um, again, I, I would try to say that I really try to be the cold hearted journalist and writer and that, you know, even even when you're doing things that you want people to hear as, as beautiful, you want to capture something special, you are, um, in a way, you're a sort of literary technician, you're, you're trying to use words to um, manipulate people and make them feel a certain way. So. Yeah, I, I totally get that. I very much appreciate the nice words, comments, but I also uh, want to kind of, you know, present myself as a hard ass writer who doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't reach for the emotional accords instantly, but occasionally earns them. Um, yeah, I don't know what, what to say beyond that. I mean, I, I, Wyoming, I, I, I'm very uh, slow to say how much I love Wyoming. It's a really complicated place. Um, and I've seen it do a lot of harm, and I don't mean that as a state. I mean, there are elements within the state that, um, that uh, I mean, you know, we, if we're talking about the reservation. Um, it's, it's the sort of glorious hope that I think a lot of people had coming out of the 
period that I wrote about, again, 20, 25 years ago, um, hasn't been realized in many ways. Although I can give you some very positive things that have happened since, I would still say that everything from the, the failure to, or the inability of the tribes to exercise the huge water right that they, that they won in the courts for, for reasons that in many ways just have to do with money and politics, um, that's a sad thing. That's a long period of time in which you have a resource of huge value and you have not been for various reasons allowed to use it the way you'd like to. Uh, we got lots of instances, I'm sure you all know, of violence within and against um, tribal members at Wind River and in the surrounding communities. Um, every now and then it, it just pops up again. Somebody has been, you know, um, shot at a de detox center or, and, and for, this, for the stupidest racist reasons, uh, these things sometimes happen. Um, it's just a shame. On the positive side, uh, I get to work still now in the documentary field with some of these younger, talented people. Jordan Dresser is the best example. He's now chair of the Arapaho Business Council. But our latest film, um, Who She Is, is really produced by Jordan and, and Sophie Barksdale. And we kind of switched places. You know, he was an associate producer on, on uh, Home From School. And now I'm an executive producer for the documentary that he really dreamt up and has been, and he and Sophie have done. So that's a good feeling too, that, you know, finally stop being quite so greedy about stories and saying, yeah, there's some young guys here who can really do this and maybe have the, the better credential for doing it than I do. Um, I'll start looking here for something to read if anybody has any other questions. Well, Jeff? Yeah. Jeff, I've got a question. Yeah. Early on, you sort of made a comment about uh, wondering how the book would be received on the uh, the reservation and you never really answered that apart from that the one fellow who gave you the blanket but you know in general how were the people how did the people receive that book well you you know i think you guys are, are meeting some folks on the reservation and and you get a much more objective answer just by asking them uh someone like allison certainly um knows all about the book um uh, it, you know, it's used in classes. I guess that's the best I can say. Um, the tribal college, it's been used. Um, at CWC, it gets used. I don't know that it's used in high school classes, but, um, and, and that's by, in, in some cases, by native teachers. So I think that's a positive thing. People mention it to me. People bring it up. Uh, I never know for sure. You know, I'm, I'm insecure enough to think that Part of that's just because they know it exists and they want to <laughs> pretend they've read it. Um, but I, I, I guess I'd still say, yeah, I'm not altogether sure, but every now and then there's a breakthrough like, a, like Hugh Friday, where it's just right out there, you know, and you know somebody appreciates things you've done. I, I think generally, you know, my way on the reservation is, is not to, I certainly don't bring it up. Um, I'm out there still quite a lot on different things seeing different people for different reasons. Um, but I don't want that to be a badge. And, and it really isn't. I think probably a lot of people who may have thought about it, you know, 15, 20 years ago, aren't even remembering it now. So again, that's kind of another non-answer, but it's best I can do. Uh, I noticed Penny has her hand raised. Do you have a question, Penny? Yeah. And you would I need would... to okay, am I unmuted now? Yes, thanks. Okay, um, I was wondering what uh, you have seen is how the casinos may have affected the, the reservation. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd say the casinos are the, the contemporary um, version of what oil and gas was when I first arrived in the 80s. Um, you know, when I came, the reservation was fascinating to me. I'd never been near one. And I quickly learned that um, I was working for High Country News at the time, but that there was a huge unemployment rate. There were some problems. There were people, non-Indians in the surrounding communities who wouldn't let their children go out there because, oh, it's such a dangerous place. Um, that turned out in my experience not to be true, but uh, why am I saying, why am I telling you that story? Um, 
Well, I'm sorry, what was the original question, Penny? Yeah, how, how, have, how has the casinos oh. affected the, the reservation? Right. So, has, has it been positive? Um, I'm going to say yes, and I'll explain why. I think when I came, what I was trying to tell you there was that oil and gas at the time was skyrocketing and of great value. And because the tribe had those resources, they actually were able to develop some of their own programs, hire their own attorneys, do a lot of things that where a lot of tribes are completely dependent on the federal government for treaty-based benefits and they're, they're scarce and sparse. And so in some ways, Wind River had some advantages because of that. Um, the casino is kind of the newer version of that. Uh, Interestingly, this casino is, I think, the only one in the country that is, I'm talking about the, sorry, the Arapaho Casino right now, the one in Riverton, um, that is managed with an agreement, treaty-based with the federal government, and there is no state compact, because the general pattern you're supposed to follow by law is tribes have to negotiate with states, develop a compact before they can introduce um, gambling. But in this case, and I'm going to toot the horn of my wife's law firm just a little bit here. Um, they demonstrated in court that the that the state, Dave Friedenthal was governor then, uh, had not acted in good faith, had not negotiated in good faith, and therefore the Arapaho tribe was able to do a um, essentially an agreement with the federal government to run a casino and not give any of the revenues up to the state, which is what happens in California and Oklahoma and a lot of the other places where you have tribal casinos. Um, so it's, a, it's just a benefit. I mean, it makes money. It's very profitable. Um, there's, there's a certain amount of, uh, what's the right word? There's some predators out there who, who see it's a, you know, it's a money machine. And, and, you know, the tribes like any government are somewhat vulnerable to that. But um, yeah, I'd say it's a plus. The Shoshone Casino north of Lander um, may not be as well it isn't as successful and they have outside management where uh, the Arapaho casino was was managed from within the tribe people they hired they didn't just make a deal with some company or to bring in everybody and they had a lot of really good things in that program they had a daycare program they had some wellness programs they were and they were you know Jim Conrad when he was running it I mean his one of his quests was to teach people how to work which you know sounds silly, but I, I watch my kids grow up. People need to learn how to work. So I think it, it had a lot of benefits. Um, I know there's a, there is a, I don't know if it's a cliche or what you'd call it. There is a, an image in some people's minds of um, reservation casinos where you know half the people in there are reservation residents without much money and they're putting it into the slot machines. Um, I think you can go to Riverton and see that's not much the case. Um, in any case, it has given the tribe and the tribes a source of revenue, and I think it's a pretty positive thing. And, you know, they'll, I mean, elders will tell you the gambling, the gambling tradition is, um, it's just there. I mean, there's, there's lots of stories in some of the old anthropological descriptions of, of the tribes back in the, um, in the 18th century, even 19th century, which include gambling. I hope that answers somewhat. Hey, Jeff, this is Warren. If I can just to add on to that, our leadership program, we stayed at the Shoshone Rose Casino and uh, the rooms were wonderful. And aside from the fact that I didn't get any soap, but it's, that's neither here nor there. But I, what I noticed was in the old days when they first started, there were a lot of old white people in there gambling and smoking. That's apparently changed now. Um, that what I saw was a lot of white younger folks gambling on Friday on a Friday night. It was like the night out when we we're going to the, to the casino. Um, the employees are mostly all native, native from the tribes, and uh, I get the feeling, not knowing anything about that particular casino, that it was quite successful, even though they could have had more people in their parking lot. So that's good, I guess. You know? yeah. It is employing native people, and that's the big thing. Um, I can do I can do a, a reading if you like. I don't sure. want to be too yeah, I think that's fantastic. Okay, there's a couple I could do. I, I, the first one I thought about doing was one about 
boarding schools, partly because I've been working on that in the documentary field and, and the boarding school reference in this book uh, ties to John Roberts from the Episcopal Church. But um, I think I'll hold off on that. I'm not sure it's one of the better passages of the book anyway. Instead, I'm gonna read from late in the book. The, um, so the battle over water ultimately after the, after the tribe had won you know, a fairly huge award. I mean, 700,000 acre feet of water a year. And that's, I'm trying to remember, I think that's half the water in the basin. So, but the, the deal was the courts, because this went through state court initially, it eventually went to the US Supreme Court, but it went through state courts. And that was really Wyoming's effort to kind of control this whole thing. They brought the lawsuit. Um, in the end, the lawsuit favored the tribes in that it gave them this large water right to use water in the basin. But the, the tricky part was the state court, and it was really the Wyoming Supreme Court, eventually modified the decision which came out of Tino Roncalio's report um, as special master, modified the decision so that it, it had to follow Wyoming's rules about what constitutes beneficial use and a beneficial use would mean, you know, um, a cotton mill, a sawmill might be considered a beneficial use if it's in the in the law and in, in the regulations. Um, and states all do it differently. Um, well, the tribe had written its own water code, and they felt they had this treaty-based water rate, which is quite different in in the way it's managed and the way it's maintained from state water rights, which often require that you either use it or you lose it. Uh, in the case of a treaty-based water right now, you got it. But what can you do to put it to work for you? Well, we know agriculture because that was the basis of the, of the legal decisions under the Winters Doctrine for tribes to get water out of a treaty that may not mention water, but that clearly is meant to steer them towards a life in agriculture. Well, if that's in the treaty, clearly they need water to do that. And in the arid west, that means you've got to have a water right to get it out of the stream. So uh, they had this big water right. They won that part of the lawsuit, but the state then had cut back what they could do with it to whatever the state basically had in its law. And that precluded what they probably wanted to do most of all, which was keep enough water in the river so that every late summer fall when the irrigators, mostly non-Indian, took the water out of the river, it wasn't reduced to basically just uh, sand and rock. They wanted to make sure there was a minimum flow, enough water going down the Wind River and its tributaries that fish could survive and spawn and do all the things fish need to do in a river. Um, so the state was blocking this. Uh, the, the state engineer is a guy named Jeff Fassett. Um, and this passage I'm gonna read comes late in this battle after Dick Baldus, who's a Shoshone tribal member, but was also a biologist working for the US Fish and Wildlife Service had arranged for, a, um, for fish planting in the river. And in some ways this was to basically, I guess you'd say embarrass the state if it allowed the river to be drained down to nothing because you'd have a bunch of fish flopping on an empty bed. Um, well, the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, that happened and immediately the Wyoming delegation was contacted by the non-Indian farmers saying this is outrageous, they can't be doing this. And Malcolm Wallop stepped in and there wasn't gonna be any more of that. But the tribes had some contacts in the environmental community and arranged through a guy named Tom Dougherty to get a load of fish. I can't remember how much, maybe six, it's probably in here. Um, anyway, thousands of fish to basically plant in the river themselves. And this is the sort of the story of that happening. <clears throat> and, and Jeff Fassett obviously is one character, um, Kate Vandemore, is the tribal water engineer, not a member of this tribe, but she does have some native blood. Um, uh, so in April, 1990, I guess I need my glasses. Wyoming state engineer, Jeff Fassett had sat stone-faced in the back of the room while the tribal joint business council held their hearing on applying 252 cubic feet per second as a minimum water level in the Wind River. The tribes knew that he would, wouldn't shut off the headgates of non-Indian irrigators to protect their in-stream flow. He questioned not only the process they used to dedicate water rights to in-stream flow, but also the meaning of the court decree, and then warned them he wouldn't help. Dedication, fine. Enforcement, that's different. When he could get the ear of tribal officials, which was rare, 
He pleaded for less posturing, more negotiation of the cordial across the fence sort. He would do his best to protect the tribes in stream flow because he certainly didn't want fish, quote, flopping on the bank, end quote. But his first obligation was to people who held state water rights. The tribes could be incredibly statesmanlike, he said. My point is, golly gee, why can't you just give us a break on these four miles? Jeff really did say things like golly gee. Vandemore reminded him that the tribes had the courts on their side and didn't feel they needed his approval. The tribes aren't limited in the use of their water. They can use it anywhere and for whatever purpose they want, she said. It's plain and simple in the decree. If the state engineer is not interested in protecting Indian water rights, that's why we need our own code. Bassett had a point though. The tribes could issue a permit protecting in-stream flow in the Wind River, but they lacked the manpower to enforce it, especially when rumors of gun-wielding uh, gun, gun irrigators were circulating on both sides of the ditch. The decree from the state Supreme Court affirmed the tribe's water rights and said the state engineer should enforce it, but Fassett insisted the tribe's process to protect in-stream flow was wrong, and he wouldn't cut off non-Indians. Then in May, a new twist. Ah, I'm going to skip this over. In May, the new twist is the Fish and Wildlife Service planted 50,000 hatchery-raised brown, brown trout in the Big Wind River. And this was Dick Baldus at work because he was working for them. Um, and this is what set off the farmers because it was done, they felt, without certainly the state approval. And Malcolm Wallop immediately went to John Turner, who you may know is Wyoming outfitter from the Jackson area, who was the head of Fish and Wildlife Service then, and said, stop this. Ah, he didn't have your approval. Stop it. And he did. There would be no more of that. To tribal members who knew their history, it was a familiar scenario. The government fulfills its trust obligation to Indians in various ways with welfare programs and housing grants and resource management. But tribes who depend too much on the federal government to defend and protect them will feel the other edge of that sword if they step on the wrong toes or act too independently. The federal government's trust relationship allows it to quash tribal actions if it doesn't like. It doesn't like for the good of the Indian people. That the congressional delegation put a stop to the Fish and Wildlife Service fish planting wasn't surprising. What was, a month later, was that a hatchery truck loaded with rainbow trout backed down to the Wind River. On June 15, Summer Marlowe drove an Arapaho elder from the east side of the reservation to join a motley group of people on the banks just below Diversion Dam, near an old swinging footbridge across the river. The elder was supposed to say a prayer, but beyond that, Sumner didn't really know what the gathering was about. Talking excitedly in the daply sunlight were fishermen from groups like Trout Unlimited, tribal officials like John Washke and Wes Martell of the Shoshone tribe, Burton Hutchinson and Joe Oldman of the Arapaho, and Dick Baldus and Kate Vandemore. There were also about 6,000 rainbow truck in a rainbow trout in a truck from a private hatchery and television cameras. cameras. Tom Dowdy had finally found something he could do. Dowdy had grown up in Wyoming outside of Laramie, but only in his 50s, long after he'd moved to Colorado, had he become aware of the reservation through Baldus. You know, when I was young, it was there for the Indians, but it wasn't a place. When the Fish and Wildlife Service balked at planting fish, Dowdy decided it was time to mobilize the wildlife community. We put the reservation on the shelf before this, he told me later. There was this huge potential for wildlife and fish. And now we found we shared the same vision of the river, tribal members, sportsmen, and conservation groups, people who never shared a common goal before. It wasn't to us a state's right versus tribal right. It became a biological issue. I try to be a realist, but it really was a magic day. I don't normally talk like this, but suddenly a lot of curtains fell down. It had a totally unrehearsed karma to it. I wish we could bottle up what happened when they stocked the river. Vandemore knew that the farmers in the state would see the camera crews as a ploy to embarrass them. That was about right. The cameras rolled as the fish splashed into the river as the old men prayed and blessed the water. Sumner Marlowe saw something the cameras didn't, an elder wiping away a tear. Roger O'Neill interviewed Vandemore, John Washke, and Joe Oldman, and the story ran on the NBC Nightly News. But for Dick Baldus, the moment that mattered most was when a dark, dark-eyed, skinny-armed 11-year-old in stonewashed jeans and a baggy black t-shirt carried the first batch of trout fingerlings in a white bucket to the edge of the river. 
The tribal elders and conservation officials stood by waiting their turn, his arm trembling with the weight of the load. Jason Baldus tipped the bucket and rainbow trout streamed like falling coin into the river. Then he looked up wonderingly at his father. Did I do it right? Kate Vandemore standing nearby felt for the first time in weeks that there was nothing for her to do, nothing to say, and it was a relief. She felt what Doherty did. This was something larger than she could ever have orchestrated beyond any one person's control. It relieved an intensifying fear that she had gone too far out on a limb alone. As the first buckets of fish wiggled in the shadow, shallows, the activity on the banks mimicked the busy splashing. <clears throat> With tribal leaders and their supporters lining up to release a bucket load and television crews maneuvering for a good camera angle, trying not to miss anything, laughing, milling about, the tribal leaders and the conservationists and the media jostled. In their midst of it, in the midst of it, Vandermoor found herself speechless and a bit dizzy. Her reverie was interrupted by a tribal lawyer who pointed to the other side of the truck that had hauled in the fish and said, hey, whose dog? There stood Honey, Vandemore's faithful border collie, front feet in the river, lapping at the tumultuous water. The dog raised her head and held Kate's gaze with her moist, adoring eyes. Then the fishtail hanging out of the side of her mouth slapped her chin and brought her attention back to the meal at hand. So writing a book like this where I got pretty deep in the weeds on the legal battle, I wanted to keep bringing it back to um, you know, the real lives of, of the people in the story. You guys, I think a bunch of you, maybe all of you have met Jason Baldus, you know, who's a, and maybe Dick too. Uh, Jason runs the Buffalo Reintroduction Program, Tribal Reintroduction Program. Um, and, you know, I, I really believe that kid that I saw uh, learning from his dad um, is kind of fulfilling the destiny that you could see taking shape in him then. Um, so there are some positive stories, even though I have to say that the, you know, the, the effort or the ability to use this great water right that they won has gone nowhere in 20 years. Um, the kind of steadfastness and, and determination that uh, I saw back then is coming down generationally when you see someone like Jason today and remember what he was like back then. We did see in the leadership program, uh, Jeff, both uh, Dick and Jason and uh, Dick told some stories of his days and um, he's getting up there in age, but he's still got the sharpness and it was his vision to bring back those bison, I know. Mm -hmm. um, and then Jason fulfilled it uh, for, with a lot of help from others, but he was the lead source for doing all that. And it was so much fun being there with the bison and Jason and some friends of his and our team and uh, the bison just sort of came up and celebrated us. They just came up and gathered yeah. around us. And, we were eating lunch. We were eating lunch as the, the, the buffalo slowly came up around us and just moved around the truck, the, the van, and, and just munched along while we were eating our lunch. <laughs> yeah. And the Shoshone now have bison, or the Arapaho now have bison as well, apparently. They have their own herd. So... We have seen progress, and I think that's a, a good positive thing for the reservation. Yeah. And uh, Dick now lives in a house that uh, is right next in Morton, and uh, right next to the Episcopal Church in Morton, by the way. They're joined, <laughs> which is amazing. And um, just fascinating to see, because there is a whole new group of people that are coming up and doing things. Yeah. <clears throat> So Dick won the Wyoming Association Award for Conservation, which is a huge thing, celebrated by the Berry Diversity Center. It was huge. I mean, me, me. This this only award that's given like to two people a year. So that was amazing that what happened here. The other thing is that Jason was really um, open about celebrating the buffalo and what he went through to go to get his master's 
Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, he has masters, Montana State University, so he could introduce the buffalo. He's been very careful about that. When then when they celebrated the reintroduction of the buffalo, it's like, wow, there is like so much that was just given, said, and celebrated on the reservation. Because this is a gift of the wildness and the integrity. Anyway, he, he said he did a lot to bring back the buffalo. Yeah. But both Dick and Jason have been tremendous figures in wildlife preservation. Yeah, they've, they've um, a lot of history between those two. And I think the, um, the expansion of the Buffalo program and the inclusion of both tribes, Jason's very active in the, in the national organization of tribes that are, there's a lot of work to do at, the, at that other end because you, the attempt here is to make sure that they're genetically um, poor, pure is the, I hate using the word pure, but that they're, they're not crossbred bison, which we have a lot of that are, have been crossbred at various times with, with cattle, with, uh, with um, other, other breeds, other species. So um, that's a big thing. And, and they need, they need a lot of, they, they can use a lot of help from the government to identify and then bring in, you know, more bison of that, of that quality and build this herd. But as you know, they're reproducing now. So it's a, it's a living herd. And if, he, if they're able to buy, and I encourage everybody with a big checkbook to get it out, that land to the south of the preserve now, they can have a huge new area. They could have a huge new area to expand into. And of course, that would just mean more bison, which would be great. We have another question for you too, a contemporary question. Uh, I think, have you seen um, the Tribal Waters? Movie that just came yeah. out. Um, I know the Humanities Council, which I'm part of, funded that along with Patagonia, and uh, I thought it was it was well done. What did you think? I mean, does it really fit the um, what, what what goes on on the res from, from your experience? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, so. Uh, Calhoun, who I, I saw, was given a writing credit on it. Um, Darren Calhoun. Um, He's he's you know he's he's good. He's um, he's been running the Wind River uh, outfitting operation um, in the canyon for a lot of years now, and I think I think what he was trying to tell and say with that was great. Um, I, I, you know, I again it gets kind of inside baseball for me. I think well, you know, you you still could you could make some better choices of who you allow to speak allows not to, who you choose to speak in a documentary. Um, but, but again, I think it's almost too, it's quibbling over small points when I start saying, you know, maybe it shouldn't have been, I'm not gonna say who, it could have been someone else who might've been a more appropriate um, voice. And again, this, this is one of those things where I think, uh, you know, as filmmakers, you could, you could do just what I do when I write a book like I did. Um, you can ask yourself, did I get the right people? Um, I almost never feel I do. And, and I'm, I'm guessing maybe Darren and the folks who directed it might have a little of that feeling too. But you know, they, the, the, the larger issue in so many ways, the, the detail uh, may not be perfectly accurate or on, on, on the mark, but the larger presentation and idea that that documentary was presenting was excellent. And it really was, it, as always, it's about, you know, do we get, to, does the tribe get to control its own resources? Um, who does this stuff really belong to? If, if a trust relationship is essentially a parental relationship, um, it's, not, it's not allowing leadership to mature within the tribe. It's, it's crippling it at every turn. And the BIA, I think we all know, I hope I can say this, is, is inadequately staffed. Um, often with the, the wrong people. And that's where a lot of decisions are made about irrigation improvements, um, you know, about management of Wind River Canyon. I mean, about all kinds of things. So I guess if Darren's, I think we can say that the point of that documentary was, you know, this is a tribal resource and this is what a tribe will do with it or tribes will do with it. 
Um, and it's not the same thing that the Bureau of Reclamation would do. Um, that's, a, that's an important point and a good point. And of course, you know, that Patagonia, mon Patagonia money, it's beautifully shot. Uh, and so you see a lot of the beauty, which is actually important. You know, that Wind River is an extraordinary reservation. I think probably you guys, most of you know some of that history that this reservation is a little bit unique in the sense that Washakie was allowed, I guess that's the wrong word, I hate that word, but Washakie was enabled to choose a location for a reservation. It really wasn't a Shoshone homeland, but it was an area that they migrated through seasonally and, <clears throat> and they just picked a great area and the, and the federal government allowed it because they were considered a friendly tribe and they thought the Shoshone would be a good buffer for the Oregon Trail travelers. In other words, those, those mean, nasty Blackfeet and other tribes coming down from the north and attacking wagon trains would have to get past the Shoshone. So great, let's put them right there. Let's give them a bunch of land because we don't know what's out there. The initial uh, Fort Bridger Treaty, I think uh, it's, it's a little undefined, but it was basically 40 million acres plus for the Wind River Reservation, which it's a whole lot more than it is now. Um, anyway, I'm just digressing here, but it's I'm not even sure why I'm digressing. It's just kind of an interesting, interesting thing that the, that the Wind River Reservation may be certainly it's one of the most beautiful reservations. It's also got a lot of really good resources from the water to the oil and gas. Um, a lot more than, you know, if you go to Pine Ridge and some of you may have, uh, that's just wall to wall poverty. Um, Wind River has a lot going for it. It's a great piece of landscape. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I think as someone who migrated into Wyoming and around to various places, I would say, think about that. You know, these are tribes who in, in, a, in a community way have ownership of the land and, and they're not, they don't, they don't sell it and move on. They got it. This is their place. I'm babbling. Anybody want to comment or ask more questions? I can do some more reading too, if you want, but I'm tired of hearing myself talk. I have a, it, probably a, not a really um, deep question, but I noticed the subtitle changed from the two editions of the book. Can you talk to that? Ah. <laughs> What did we change? Well, it went from what you see in clear water life on the Wind River Reservation yeah, yeah. to what you see in clear water Indians, whites, and a battle over water in the American West. Yeah. Um, yes. That, uh, <laughs> I turned on, yeah. Um, that was very much a change that I wanted to make. I felt like, I love this title. I, I think Wes Martell said it to me. Mm. Uh, but he tells me he didn't. So maybe I just made it up, but it doesn't actually tell you what the book's about. It sounds like Terry Tempest Williams can be like sort of poetry about being on the water. Um, and, you know, the book uh, is very much about a, a battle over water. So yeah, on the paperback, we, we added the subtitle, um, got a different look for the book too, for the cover. Uh, and it was intentional. That's all I can say. That, that subtitle in the first one, you know, I've completely forgotten about that. It reflected what my agent and, and publisher, original publisher, Knopf, um, wanted in the book. They wanted a portrait of a reservation. And I felt I kind of gave them that, but I wanted it to have a, um, a real live story arc. And that's what the water gave it. So uh, that's a good question. Maybe realize well, something I'd completely forgotten. <laughs> it's something that's been on my mind since I looked up both books. <laughs> so thank you. You bet. Shall we read you about John Roberts? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> He's a hot topic these days, especially with the Episcopal Church, because he's being honored as a bridge from the native land to the native folks to the white folks, which I think he pretty much did. But in my research about him, 
in my experience, having followed him as one of the clergy out there, he was a tough act to follow and not a good particularly one for our present time because um, it was paternalism at its, at its worst, but his love was great. It's a good yeah. way to put it. I think, that, I think that's a, a, actually a great description. Um, I, I, I had a section of the book, as I say, I really was doing a portrait of the reservation in a sense because I was using water as just a thing to hang these different elements on. And part of it was about Al Redman and his Wyoming basketball group. Um, these kids, that was the first time I actually did a sweat, I think was at Vince Redman's place um, with the basketball team, a bunch of little high school kids and there's marijuana in the air and smoke and you know all kinds of stuff. It was kind of, wow, this is interesting. But I really liked Al, he's still around. And uh, yeah, this is, this is a section that starts with him and the basketball team and then gets into Roberts and the boarding schools. There's a 1940s picture of Redmond as a boy of about 13, sitting on a bench with 11 other boys wearing high top sneakers and black socks, smiling a big smile. The faces, all the boys are smiling, or what you notice. Old pictures of Indian children do not feature many smiles. Well, that was basketball, Redmond said half a century later. We had a pretty good coach. I was a day student. I'd walk down to the mission, but it only went to eighth grade. Most of the students boarded. The smiling coach standing next to the team was an Episcopal priest. In the early days, schooling for the children of Wind River came down to three choices. They could, be, they could be shipped off to faraway Bureau of Indian Affairs boarding schools, or they could go to the missionary and boarding schools right on the reservation, or they could disappear into the sagebrush. The notion of removing children nation, Indian children nationwide from the reservations to boarding schools came from Captain Richard Henry Pratt, who started the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in an abandoned Pennsylvania military barracks in 1879. Pratt expressed great admiration for Indians and felt their segregation on reservations was an injustice, not a recognition of sovereignty. He wanted to take the tabula rasa of young Indian children and write something civilizing on it. Kill the Indian in him and save the man, he wrote. Funded by the federal government, similar schools cropped up in Kansas, Oregon, Oklahoma, Nebraska. It was like taking a child from a tropical island and putting her on an ice floe cut off from their families who wouldn't have been able to read their letters home, the children were taught in English and surrounded by diversions that mimicked white institutions, baseball teams, orchestras, even Greek fraternities. The boarding schools were trade schools where, children, where girls were taught to type and cook and make dresses, while boys raised livestock, made shoes, and worked at a blacksmith's forge. The immersion in white culture was complete. When the school year ended, Sorry, I'm looking ahead here for a moment. When the school year ended, students were given summer jobs far away from the reservation where it was feared they would revert to their old squalid ways. The late Ben Friday Sr., the revered Arapaho leader, was removed from his family for five uninterrupted years. Friday described the experiences to his grandson, Pat Goggles, who told me about it. It took three or four days by train to get to Gen Genoa, said Goggles, at the boarding school in Nebraska. When they got there, the first thing they did to the children was they stripped them of all their clothing. They were made to bathe and use various kinds of cleansers to cleanse themselves and their body and their hair of lice and whatever else it was thought they had. Their hair was cut and they were immediately put into barracks where they were still treated somewhat like prisoners of war. I remember him telling me the first word in English that he knew was broom. I said, why was that? And he said, well, if you got talking Indian, they made you kneel on that broom for three or four hours until you wouldn't talk your language anymore. You were forbidden to talk your language. You were forbidden to talk about your tribe. You were forbidden to sing your music. You were forbidden even to do crafts of your own culture. The old chiefs surprisingly exhorted young people to go and even sent their own sons to the boarding schools. It was partly a negotiating ploy, a show of good faith in exchange for government aid, and partly a genuine belief that for the tribe to survive, they had to master the knowledge of the society that had conquered them. They were thinking, as always, of the future. Sharpnose sent his son Dickens and Black Hole his, his son Sumner, each 14 years old, to Carlisle in 1881 with a dozen children from both Wind River tribes. 
It's hard to imagine how difficult this must have been for traditional people accustomed to close extended families and unschooled themselves. Fewer than half of this first batch of children would live to return to the reservation. At boarding school, many Indian children were exposed to new diseases, none perhaps more debilitating than homesickness. When being taught as one school administrator put it, quote, to despise every custom of their forefathers, including religion, language, songs, dress, ideas, and methods of living. Even when schools were built on the reservation, children seemed to wilt in the shoes and coats and dresses they were made to wear. The Reverend John Roberts came to Wind River in 1883 as an Episcopal missionary and soon was being paid by the government to run a boarding school on the west side of the reservation for both Shoshone and Arapaho children. Putting missionaries in charge of reservation schools was government policy in the late 19th century, despite constitutional prohibitions against mix mixing church and state. President Ulysses Grant's administration saw it as a way to clean up corruption among Indian agents, but it also gave the missionaries a large trap for capturing young heathen souls. Like so many other policies, it forced Indians either to adopt the culture of the conqueror or live in secret in the wilds or in one's mind. There were bars on the windows of the government industrial school at Fort Washakie and a frightening death rate among Indian students. Roberts, who would devote his life to the Wind River Ministry, wrote to the Indian service in 1901, quote, in school, they have good care, wholesome food, well cooked. They have plenty of fresh air, outdoor exercise and play. Yet under these conditions in school, they droop and die while their brothers and sisters in camp live and thrive. Anyway, there's more on that. This is about page 115 in the book and it goes on about St. Michael's and a lot of this stuff. And so a lot of stories, um, various people told me about their experience in the schools and reservations, but um, it's funny. <laughs> I really haven't read this in quite a while, and I, I forgot I wrote about Roberts in the school that much. There's quite a bit in here. So what, what are you all going to do? To, I mean, I, a lot of non-Indians, we, we've, we've had a bunch of uh, screenings of the school, about, of the documentary about boarding schools, and we often do panels afterwards, which I usually don't, I, I usually moderate. I, did the film, but they want to talk to Jordan and Yufna. They want to talk to people who experienced the whole thing. And, and one of the questions that comes up inevitably, and I, I'm not making fun when I say this of the person, but someone will pop up and say, I really you know, want to help on the reservation, but I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go or who to talk to. What can I do? Um, and I am making fun of them, obviously. I don't mean to because it's sincere. Um, but I sort of throw that out at a group like yours because you, you clearly have an interest in the reservation and that question of, you know, what do you do? I mean, I make, I make stories. That's what I do. Uh, whether that helps or not, I have no idea. But um, you have this interest. I don't think we have any Native Americans in the room right now. Or I would ask them. Anybody want to jump in? Well, I think you point out um, something very critical is to ask them. You know, we can come up with a bunch of ideas, um, but I think you need to ask them. You need to have the buy-in. Yeah, I think I think, and I, I'll, I'll give you. I don't want to jump in. If anybody else has something to say, jump in now on this on this subject. Well, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. We can. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um. I'm in it for the long run, Jeff, for the long run. You know, and when I see um, people understanding the spirituality of many Americans, that is just great. So um, there are presences at the University of Wyoming, um, which is good to rely on, but also not to give up. You know, say, okay, this is it. We want to listen tenderly. We want to honor as we have after the murder of Matthew Shepard, it's like we are an open people. And don't forget that 
our openness is not contingent on results. It's just contingent on our compassion. So um, one of the organizations that I've been in contact with is called the Physicians for Social Responsibility. And they track toxicity everywhere where it occurs, especially in water issues and air. But to say, you know, good science helps us care for each other. And honor people like Dick Baldus and Jason, you know, we could just keep doing that. As I'll say, the relationships are ultimately important. Thank you. And I can add to that a little bit, having worked for five years with the Shoshone on the, at the Shoshone mission. And of course, I went in there, you know, as a request because nobody else would do it. And I was also covering the Episcopal Church in Lander and the one in Atlantic City. But I went in there mostly just to learn and experience and not to promote what Roberts used to do. But uh, his legacy was so great, you had to break through some of that to even have a relationship because they expected you to be like Roberts. And um, it was true paternalism and you just can't do that anymore. Um, empowerment is what I know now the Episcopal Church does. And um, uh, empowerment is a lot different than sort of handouts and uh, making people depend. And I would say that um, one of the things I've been able to do since that time, this was the late 80s, is to really tell white people about it. Um, I think if you took a poll in the state of Wyoming, how many people have ever been to the reservation, it would be a small percentage. And how many even know it's there is maybe even a small percentage, especially with newcomers. And unless people get out and actually experience something about the Rapaho, the Shoshone, any native tribe or the reservation itself, they really have no concept. Uh, like I think uh, um, <clears throat> Allison Sage said at our Riverton gathering this past weekend, they still think we got bows and arrows and that's, we live with that. And, and that's what white people think, you know? And I think that's probably to a great extent true. So we have to change that whole thing and, and what we can do with the people we work with, um, which is basically white Christians and some others, Buddhists, a Buddhist anyway, <laughs> and, and the LDS and the, all the groups that we're working with, including the tribes. Um, <clears throat> and we need to do that as much as we can do. And I think all these things are a way to help do that. So that's what I, I don't think we can go in and save anybody. Um, People need to work on their own empowerment, save, save their own lives. We can help them by helping other people understand the reservation and then what we need to do to help them be more honorable to it. I think it's the best way to put it. So where do you start if you're looking for a way to empower? Read Jeff's book is one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the beginning. There are a lot of good stories out there. There's some good TV shows right now um, or, or movies that are not that are fictional. <clears throat> One I like the best that we used with all of our teenagers in the church a number of years ago was called Powell Highway, which is hard to find now, I understand, but it was an, actually done on the Northern Cheyenne and Billings area. But that gives you an insight into, and it's done in a humorous way, so white people can at least, not, they're not going to be attacked. Hey, we're, we're on res dogs, too. If you've seen that, it's, it's relatively new. It's good. Res dog. And, uh, and um, that's, that's good, too. That's a little tougher to watch because it's got some raw stuff in there. Yeah. But it's got some great scenes, like that old Indian guy who claimed he reappears in the middle of crisis to talk about his day at the Battle of the Little Bighorn, which he admits later on it wasn't there. <laughs> and his horse falls in a hole. You know, I mean, it's got some really funny scenes in it. But it, it really is drawn. And these are done by Native folks, mostly. You know, uh, I think there's another one out there now, too. I can't remember the name of it. It's, it's also very powerful. So there's a huge one called Wind River. I don't know if you saw that. But it had yeah. to do with the imposition of the uh, fracking community and what they did to Native women. Has anybody seen that? Yep. After yeah, a while. Oh, yeah. good. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so that's that's Taylor Sheridan, the guy who's done the show, the very popular new show, Yellowstone, and a bunch of other stuff, and wrote some good movies in the past. I, you know, again, I feel like I do this kind of quibbling inside baseball thing on this one too. I think the the notion that you had to have a you know a non-Indian hero as the agent uh, who's investigating the this is the MMIW story that they're telling the missing and murdered indigenous women, which is a real problem. It's actually a problem with people because they're more men than women that have disappeared from reservations. But, um, you know, I mean, it just to, in a way where everything, every time that happens and it's not grossly inaccurate, it, it sort of normalizes the fact of reservation communities for the non-Indians. And that's a good thing. Um, so again, I'll quibble about little aspects of some of the stories that they tell, but geez, they've chosen to tell those stories. That's a good thing, uh, unless they terribly distort them, which, which he did not, just somewhat. Um, <laughs> I, you know, my, my line to those people who show up at those, when we do panels and, and screenings, um, when those questions are asked, and they all, all seem to be asked, is it's really pretty simple. Um, I mean, I love what Warren's saying, and I think when you have the, the ability to, to really um, affect empowerment, that's a great thing to do. But for, for ordinary folks who just show up at a screening and want to do something, um, it's pretty simple. You show up. Uh, you know, people, some people, at least when we first got to Wyoming, really tried to make the reservation sound like a scary place. Uh, it isn't at all. Go to a powwow, you know. Go to any. Go to a basketball game. I mean, you're you're totally welcome. Um, and 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 I think they notice people like Warren who come back again and again, who aren't just going to come for a moment and do a good deed and then they're gone. Uh, so show up and keep showing up because that that will make you different from a lot of people who who make a visit to a reservation and never go there again. Um, and then so the don't thing, be a yeah. So don't 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 be a tourist. Go and educate yourself and submerge yourself in the in the culture as much as you can. Yeah. Learn, learn. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I think the general rule is you'll be welcomed, and I think I think the other thing is a little bit contradictory, and that is get out of the way. So in my case, because as I've said, I'm a kind of selfish storyteller. I I don't want to give up a good story when I get it, but you know. It was time uh, after after home from school when Jordan came up with an idea to do a documentary on MMIW, um, and it was a really good idea. Uh, it was time to not be the producer and let him be the producer and realize. And I'm finding out more on a new project I'm working on. There's a lot of talent out there. They don't. They're just not empowered, as as Warren said. I mean, put a camera in the hands of somebody, you know, a generation younger than me, and it's kind of natural to them, which it never was to me. And, and give a, give an Indian kid that chance. Let them go out and tell a story. And I think the Episcopal Church is doing that with Juan Willow right now. Um, I don't know if you if you guys are. I'm, I'm not even sure I know it correctly, but I think I do. Um, Juan has been where he was in home from school as a young man, um, but he's been working on a documentary that has to do with the um, repatriation of, of some of the artifacts that the church has. Uh, back to Wind River. Um, anyway, hmm. I may have that wrong, but I think I know. Anyway, get out of the way. Yeah, let let people like that step in and make their mistakes and get better at it, and they will. Well, your passage <laughs> on <laughs> your passage on stalking the river was um, showed that. Um, tribal people taking things into their own hands and doing it their own way um, is is good because so often the water problem is presented as something that is a reservation problem but it's a statewide situation and the the pollution and and the uranium and so on so um, to to take a, a broader picture for any one of these situations is is a good idea. And then, um, you know, we can all step in. Uh, what can we do for and uh, but uh, is one thing, which is, you know, not the way to approach it. The way to approach it is what can we do together 
in a broader sense. Is there any legislation coming up about the reservations at a state level? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not well enough tuned in to know. Um, of course, we, we do have a, a tribal member from Wind River in the legislature now, Andy Clifford, who's very good. But um, I'm not, Warren, you might be more up to date than I am on this. No, really, I don't. I, we haven't heard of anything that specifically relates other than the jurisdiction for law enforcement is always an issue. You know, who gets to arrest who out there? It's very confusing. Um, I don't know if it's still the case, but, you know, if a white person is stopped by a BIA law enforcement person on the reservation and because they're speeding, they can't be given a ticket. They have to wait to, hype to see a state patrolman come from wherever they're coming to give that person a speeding ticket because they're not authorized to do that. Um, that, that's, that may have been changed. That, that's the way it was a number of years ago. It was really confusing because you never knew who was in charge out there. <laughs> you know, the FBI covered crimes, BIA covers other things. Um, for years, people hated the BIA when who were out there. You know, they didn't trust the officers because I've heard stories about call the BIA and you'll get beaten, you know? <laughs> so. Um, there's those kinds of stories. Um, and then you got the state highway patrol and then you got the uh, sheriff's department, which has jurisdiction in some areas. So it's really confusing. And I know they were trying to talk about how to give more detailed, you know, law enforcement things. Um, but I haven't really heard of, there's another issue out there too, but I can't remember what it is. I think the, the cross deputization stuff has come and gone in various sectors. I think at one point the the Fremont County Sheriff's Department did have an agreement, a limited agreement to do some work with BIA cross deputizing. I have no, I like you, I don't really know today where all that stands. Warren and I were talking earlier about something that uh, is probably of interest to everyone that um, is simply just paying attention to the reservation. And that is, we're in the, there in the middle, the, the reservation is in the middle of a kind of a meaningful transition between a, a generation of elders that were pretty much ruling the roost when I, when I first arrived, including, um, and this is not a traditional thing, serving on the business councils and running things, people like Burton Hutchinson and Crawford White. Um, that generation is, is sort of, well, it's, in some cases it's literally passing, but more importantly, uh, there's a, a younger group that's kind of stepping in and has been for you know, really the last four to six years um, to where we're gonna have a whole new, probably very different um, set of leaders on the reservation, at least in the secular part of life. Um, a lot of them show rap, a lot of them much more ready for the Shoshone and Arapaho tribes to work together governmentally, which has not been true for a, quite a period of time. There's been, there's been real strong sort of battling between the tribes. Um, but that seems to be changing. Um, you look at the young leadership that's literally on the business councils now, it's a mixed bag. You know, you, you, you could get very particular about the good ones and the bad ones, but that's true in every government that I've ever seen. I just think it's really kind of fascinating to see a younger generation come into, come into power. And it also makes me feel really old. Because, you know, when I came out and wrote the book, we were all the young guys, I thought. Uh, Pat Goggles and Wes and all, everybody. Now we're, they're all, we're all old. A lot more interracial marriage, I understand now, too, which is helping. Uh, that came up Take in our- Take Jeffrey. Warren and I are older. We share a birthday. <laughs> I won't tell you the years, but I'd be glad to. But I, I wanted to just ask a question, even though it's near our end of time, but I've been tracking the issue of toxicity. And in your book, you mentioned radium tailings, uranium tailings. Um, I've been tracking fracking around here. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about water in terms of like, how can we just say this is real in a state that wants to deny it? 
but when water has benzene in it or other chemicals, you cannot drink it. When I went to the celebration of the buffalo, with Jason Baldwin's and others, they, I went to the kitchen to get a glass of water and they said, don't drink it, don't drink it. You can only drink plastic bottled water. Anyway, do you want to say a word or two about toxicity? Or you may not want to, you may want to say, that help us. Yeah, that, that, so boy, you, you're, you're right. It's a whole, um, it's a deep well, let's put it that way, quite literally. Um, when Kate Vandemore was still the, state, the, the tribal water engineer, she tried really hard to get, have groundwater be part of the uh, water right awarded by the courts and failed at that. Um, the, the courts did not include groundwater, but that actually is what started the whole battle over Wind River water was the city of Riverton uh, drilling wells and, and the tribe saying, wait a minute, that's our water you're gonna pull out of those wells. Anyway, that, that all, particularly on that end of the reservation, the eastern end, um, you know, the, the tailings from the, what used to be the uranium mills, now the sulfur mill, um, just past Arapaho there, uh, that water, <clears throat> there's, there's almost nothing you can do to really fix that. There's been some federal money put into it, um, but, you know, it, it, there's a lot, there are a lot of uranium tailings basically put on the ground, um, on the eastern side of the reservation. They were also put in the foundations of houses in some cases, which is why a lot of, rate, a lot of Riverton homes have really high radon readings. Um, yeah, I don't, know, I don't know what to say about that. The, the federal government is, has got a responsibility there, which it does seem to recognize, but it's not quite clear whether there's the money to do the amount of fix up that's needed, or for that matter, whether it can be fixed. Um, and that was a, another good, interesting case of, you know, Riverton, which is very big on development of any kind. They're, they're all about economic development. But when they had a chance for a uranium mill, wouldn't you know, they put it just outside of Riverton on the reservation. And I don't, yeah, anyway. But there's also this natural radiation. Um, Dave Love used to tell me that the, Hot Springs outside of Fort Washakie was one of the most radioactive sites in Wyoming. Um, so anyway, yeah, th 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 there's not enough water monitoring um, really to catch all this stuff. Well, Anne Marie, I think we're coming down to our end of our time. Sure. So I. Um did want to just put out a reminder that, uh, as Sal mentioned, we're having a panel, Water is Life panel discussion on November 16th at 6 p.m. There'll be more information coming out on that as the details get firmed up. And then um, Jeff mentioned uh, the uh, documentary he most recently worked with, I think, is the Who, Who Is She? Who is she? Who she? Who she is, excuse me. And um, I guess they had the virtual screening last night, I just saw, um, but it's gonna be uh, uh, screened in Riverton on December 6th and in Lander on December 9th. And then some other dates coming up in 2023. Um, so just some of the, some plugs for things coming up and to, to look for. And the uh, Tribal Waters video that Warren mentioned is on, um, uh, PBS, I believe. You can see it there. And um, I think, is it on YouTube as well, Warren? Do you know? Yeah, it's, it's, think... it's a lot of places right now. Okay. So you even put a, a link to it, I think, in one of your emails. I did. It's, yeah, so that would have been on YouTube. So, you know, it, it's something else to, to consider. And um, yeah, and so I just invite Jeff, do you have a final word or two you'd like to offer us? No, I think I, I talked too much altogether. <laughs> I, you know, the, a lot of the panels we've done, um, I, I learned this right at the beginning with, with Home From School, that having um, Jordan with me or Yufna or um, Crystal Seabaring, anyway, any number of people who've involved in these fields for the tribes, 
um, was just magic um, and really important to everybody. So if, if I had one of those guys with me now, I'd turn it over to them because in many ways, they're who you want to hear from in this whole process of just getting to be uh, a more whole community, I guess is what I would say it is. Um, but no, I've enjoyed this. It's fun talking to you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for thank joining you. us all the way from Maryland. And um, yeah, and we look forward to either reading or rereading the book as maybe the case and, and wish you well. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.